صباح الخير جميعا Good morning everyone أنا اسمي نديم حويبي المدير Good morning everyone I'm Nadim Hoodi Executive Director of the Arab Reform Initiative Allow me first to welcome all of you in this conference I would like to welcome you in Lebanon for those for all those who came from abroad I would like to thank you for your participation in this second annual conference of the Environmental Politics Conference, the second annual Environmental Politics Conference, uh, and uh, the uh, translation in Arabic uh, might not be very clear because here we're not only talking about the politics, but about the policies as well related to the environment. We will be talking today uh, about uh, the just environmental transition. My colleague, Salim Karajajjo, the program officer, will be talking more about this uh, uh, conference. We will be having participants online and others present here in the room. I would like to welcome all of you. In brief, I would like to talk about uh, the Arab Reform Initiative and about uh, our uh, environmental politics uh, conference, about our vision in general regarding the environment, what we aim to achieve through this uh, project. The Arab Reform Initiative is a think tank, a regional think tank that works in the Middle East and North Africa region, so the MENA region. It was founded in 2005. The main idea behind the foundation of the Arab Reform Initiative was that there was a reform, a democratic reform and economic reform agenda coming from the region itself, from the MENA region itself. Of course, uh, the region has witnessed many changes. Uh, the approaches have changed mainly in terms of how practically to implement uh, the agendas and mainly after 2011. However, our work has always been uh, linked and is always linked to three main pillars, three main foundations. We work first, or the first pillar is support and developing internal local research uh, by researchers from the region, whether they are present inside the region or abroad. But the most important thing is for the methodology to be linked to local agendas that have been developed by the communities that are directly affected by the policies in general. We use many techniques and we work with many researchers. We have the fellow researchers, we have local researchers that we work with, and we work with many researchers that have just started working in the field, we give a chance uh, to many researchers as well that have been present in the field for many years, uh, but who would like to reach other uh, target audience. The second pillar is linked to creating uh, spaces for sharing knowledge in the region, South-South exchanges. It is very important to learn from each other's experiences in different countries. It is very important to share our experiences in many, uh, regarding many topics, mainly environmental uh, topics. Uh, we are present in uh, Paris, in Tunisia, and Lebanon, but we work with many fellow researchers from across the region. We are trying as much as possible to take advantage of our presence in Europe uh, to develop a platform or to be a platform for the north-south exchange. It's not only about the north to south uh, flow of information. We're trying to have a south to north as well flow of information. We are trying as much as possible to make our voices heard, uh, to make the voices of the local agendas heard in other countries. 
mainly in Western countries, and uh, we're trying uh, to make our voices heard, uh, mainly among uh, policy makers, decision makers in Europe, uh, mainly as well those who are affecting uh, the development of agendas. How do we see ourselves? What are our objectives and our priorities? We still work on research. We build on the sharing of experiences and building of connections between researchers in order to advance uh, a, a new reform agenda and just uh, agenda for the region. We work mainly on developing communities of practice These communities of practice are about developing ecosystems made of people that are concerned with change. We facilitate uh, the exchange and the sharing of knowledge between these persons. We are convinced that change in our region is difficult, but is possible as well, thanks to the building of bridges between different activists researchers, academia, and decision makers. So the intersection between all these stakeholders uh, paved the way towards change. Two or three years ago, approximately, we decided to start shedding light on the environment. Of course, we're not an environmental institution, but we consider that environment is a very important topic for us. So what about our vision for our environmental uh, programs and projects? We consider that, that exactly like any other topic, environment is related to justice. We're talking here about a different ecosystem perhaps, uh, but uh, this is a source of wealth. And in the sector, we're witnessing a lot of injustice in terms of who are affected and who are not. We noticed as well that the environmental topic is related to the governance topic as well. When we talk about governance, we cannot but notice the link between that, between governance in general and between different topics, mainly environment. This is why we consider that environment is all about uh, uh, policies or about politics as well, because there are persons that are benefiting from the status quo. There are many vulnerable groups that are affected, uh, and any sustainable environmental approach should be based on a political approach. And I'm not talking only about the narrow uh, political field, but about policies in general, because we know that everything starts with this political arena. And we know that all policies are devised in this uh, political field. And we know how uh, conflicts are around priorities in certain cases. We noticed as well that the environmental solutions are, are not only technical solutions, they're political, social, economic solutions. They are all about choices, social choices that we cannot but talk about. We have tried from the very beginning to talk about that and to see environment under that light. Who is working uh, on environmental topics? Uh, in the region? What about activism, environmental activism in the region? We notice that when we answer uh, these uh, questions, uh, we cannot but widen our scope of attention. Many persons working on the environmental topic are not environmentalists and do not consider themselves as such, uh, but uh, they are eager to notice a change in the field. This is why we decided to start working from the region on these environmental priorities. I will stop here so that uh, I do not delve into uh, more details, and I will give the floor to my colleague, Sarin, who will be talking about uh, this uh, concept. Thank you, and welcome again. Thank you, Nadir. Welcome, everyone, to Lebanon. We have interpretation that is available, so you can uh, grab your headsets or use the interpretation uh, through Zoom. Good morning. Welcome to this uh, second annual environmental politics conference. 
organized by the Arab Reform Initiative. We are extremely pleased to hold this conference in person in Beirut, despite the different challenges that we have been facing in the country. Uh, every morning, I wonder about uh, uh, the war or the conflict uh, that I will have to follow uh, in our daily news, whether in Palestine, in Iraq, in Yemen, in Tunisia, in Lebanon, in Iraq, in Sudan, and other countries. And we know that uh, the repercussions of, uh, these, uh, uh, of these wars have been felt everywhere in the region. A few days ago, I was talking with an activist from the region, and she told me that we have the weapons, uh, but we don't have food. A year after the launch, after uh, the annual, the first annual environmental politics conference, uh, we cannot uh, but uh, work under uh, the framework of our program, environmental program, uh, to uh, stress on the work of different researchers in the field. Uh, through our program, we aim at tackling different important topics related to environment, to climate in the region, while stressing on uh, justice, the social justice. We have decided uh, this year in our environmental politics program to stress during this conference on the just transition. This is a concept uh, that has uh, uh, started in the 90s in the United Na in the United States. So we started hearing about the just the transition in the 90s and even before that in the 80s. And uh, this uh, concept uh, has uh, uh, been developed uh, during the past years in many countries and it became a solid pillar uh, that uh, cannot uh, but translate the different uh, demands, uh, mainly of uh, the labor force of workers. There were many as well, uh, there were many uh, um, act, uh, activism, uh, there were many protests uh, for democracy, for uh, energy sovereignty, for a just transition, uh, for many uh, other topics such as starting colonialism. So we've uh, witnessed many uh, similar protests and, uh, across many countries. And we've noticed uh, that uh, many have uh, many groups have been working for the rights of women, the rights of farmers, for promoting environmental justice, social justice. And all these discussions uh, and all these topics uh, will be discussed uh, today and uh, tomorrow during our second annual environmental politics conference uh, with the COP27 uh, that uh, will be held in Egypt and the COP28 in the UAE, we cannot but ask how will the discussions around the just environmental transition uh, be held? What about these transition, energy transition, food systems transition? What about the water systems uh, in the region and across the countries? Can we say that we will have a just framework uh, that will allow us to work all together in solidarity in the MENA region, uh, this uh, conference, second annual environmental politics conference about the just environmental transition, will be gathering around 25 uh, activists, researchers, and journalists to discuss uh, that topic, which is just transition. We will be talking about how to develop alliances, uh, how to talk about oppression, about unjust access uh, to water, to resources, uh, uh, what about uh, transition, energy transition, in the African region and the uh, Middle Eastern region. The main objective of this conference is to develop a community of practice that will be uh, supporting uh, different uh, persons working in that field in the region and abroad. The aim would be as well uh, to promote our knowledge and develop our knowledge re uh, regarding just transition in the region. Allow me to thank uh, Nadim Nasma from Paris and all uh, the team of the Arab Reform Initiative, Julia, Ziad, Malak, uh, uh, different uh, uh, Clemence, Andrew, Saeed, Ahmed, and all the moderators of uh, today's and tomorrow's sessions, all those who have participated in uh, the organization of uh, this conference. We hope uh, that we'll have uh, a, a more justice in our region, uh, not only in environmental uh, topics, but uh, in all fields. We still have five to ten minutes before the first uh, session that will be moderated by Julia, and we will have many panelists in, in this first session. So thank you. And uh, 
we will directly start with the first session. Julia, Katia, Ali, Sarmad, and Farah. And thank you, thank you for joining this uh, first uh, uh, session about uh, just the transition a framework for coalition building in the MENA region. I'm Julia Scher, I would like Okay. I would like to welcome you again to this conference. Before delving into the details of this session, I would like to remind you that every speaker can speak in English or in Arabic, and we have interpretation that is available through Zoom and even here in the room. Uh, in our session, since all the speakers understand English, but not Arabic, we decided to moderate uh, this session in Arabic, uh, sorry, in English, in English, not in Arabic, since everyone understands English. So I will switch to English uh, and you can listen to the interpretation in Arabic if you want. On uh, just transition in our uh, region, the Middle East and North Africa. We have titled this session, Just Transition, a Framework for Coalition Building in the Middle East and North Africa. It is a question. We begin the conference with a question. Uh, it is a big one, and it is one we hope will stay with us throughout the next sessions, throughout the next days, um, as we begin to zoom in on specific ecological issues throughout the different sessions, and as we begin to zoom in on the challenges, the catastrophes, the spaces of hope as well. So in this session, we wanted to begin with some basics and with some concepts that are not so basic. What is just transition in the first place? How does the answer change depending on who you ask? To what extent can this concept in its various definitions be a unifying framework for building coalitions in our region? What are the possibilities, the potentials, but perhaps also the limitations and the contradictions when we bring this concept to our geography. And how does this affect coalition building and trans-regional solidarities? We are delighted to ask these questions to four um, very creative and interesting thinkers and practitioners who each bring a very unique perspective to this topic. Uh, based on how they see it through different lenses, uh, different sectors, but also from different geographies. I'm going to introduce them in the order with which they will be speaking. So first, to my right, is Cathy Sandwell, who is a senior project officer at the Transnational Institute, uh, which, for those of you who don't know, is an international activist think tank headquartered in Amsterdam, uh, and that does a lot of work on just transition and which we have uh, found inspiring in our own work. Um, her work focuses especially on land and resource justice, food sovereignty, oceans, and of course, just transition. And she has lived in Canada, Germany, the United Kingdom, and the Netherlands. 
and has been involved in a range of food, community, environmental, and social justice organizations. Uh, Ali Aznag, here to my left, is an activist and researcher from Morocco. He is the coordinator of the Siada Network for Food Sovereignty in North Africa. He is an expert on food sovereignty, um, although on this panel, we have asked him to focus more on um, the coalition that he has participated in, one of the coalitions in our region that is using this concept of just transition. And so we are very excited to have him here with us today. Farah Daibis, to my immediate left, is a senior program manager at the Friedrich Ebert Foundation in their political feminism program in the Middle East and North Africa. Farah focuses on integrating feminist perspectives into regional discussions related to socioeconomic and political challenges. So we have asked Farah to bring to us today what a feminist perspective uh, provides for this concept of just transition. And last, but certainly not least, um, Sarmad Amjad, who uh, is here with us from Iraq. He's a program coordinator um, who works on transitional and transformative justice, conflict resolution, and advocacy programs at the local level. So thank you all for being with us today. We have asked each of them to begin with 10 to 12 minutes of remarks, presentations, after which we will open the floor to discussion. And we are going to begin with uh, Kathy. Floor is yours. Hello, thank you, everyone. It's um, yeah, a huge honor to be here, and a big thanks for the invitation and to the interpreters for making it possible for me to listen and to speak in English. Um, is the PowerPoint? <laughs> Good. Um, yeah, so I was asked to introduce a little bit the, the framework of Just Transition in quite a, quite a general way, uh, speaking from an international perspective. So I should say I'm, I'm not a specialist in the MENA region, so I'm really fascinated to hear the discussions in the coming days uh, and to hear, the, yeah, to hear your answers to the questions of what a Just Transition can mean for the region. Um, next slide, first slide. Thank you. Um, yeah, so just transition, I would really describe as a kind of a framework for thinking about how the necessary changes that we need to make to address the climate crisis, how they should take place. Um, and I kind of emphasize, although I think it's been very clear already in the program that we're talking about not just changes to our energy system, but to our food system, to the way that we uh, organize our cities, to housing, to a whole range of different sectors. Uh, and I think the core kind of driving logic of the idea of just transition is that those people who have been most impacted by the current system should not be the people who are bearing the cost of transitioning to a new system. So that's a, the kind of fundamental driving ethic. Um, Serena already spoke a little bit about the history of just transition. As she said, it came out of the, the United States and Canada and out of a kind of process of aiming to form coalitions specifically between labor and environmental justice movements. So where companies were responding to increasing environmental reg uh, regulations by saying, oh, well, then we're going to have to cut a lot of jobs. Uh, communities and workers really came together to kind of find common cause and say, actually, we can make the necessary environmental changes without costing people their jobs. And then over the, the following decades, it really expanded to include a number of different movements. So to uh, embrace indigenous and feminist perspectives and work with other movements. And then it's increasingly been used at the national and international level. For example, a large campaign by movements um, resulted in the language of just transition being included in the framework of the Paris Agreement. Uh, sorry, in the preamble to the Paris Agreement. So that was, on the one hand, a huge movement victory, um, but on the other hand, it also created a, a huge amount of co-optation, where a lot of different actors are now kind of working to define and defend their own definitions of just transition, some of which really are not oriented to what I think any of us would recognize as justice. So we tend to try now to, to think about just transition as a, a kind of a space or a field of contestation. So a space where different visions of the kind of future we want are, are being put forward and, and debated and discussed. 
um, it can be helpful, next slide please, um, it can be helpful to think uh, in that context though about what is not a just transition. Uh, the first kind of obvious thing is that not just not a transition, that no transition occurs, that we don't make the, the scale and type of changes necessary uh, to address or avert the climate crisis. And that is unfortunately quite a real possibility still. Uh, but then the other possibility is that technological transitions occur, but without, uh, without justice. So perhaps that means that uh, workers who are displaced from a polluting industry have no decent jobs and are kind of left out in the cold. Perhaps it means that there's no ecological remediation or regeneration of spaces damaged by past extractivism. Uh, or perhaps it means the creation of new kinds of exploitation, new kinds of green grabbing, new kinds of extractivism. And that is an, uh, an extremely relevant <laughs> possibility and one I think especially relevant for this region. Um, next slide, please. So this is a, a slogan that sums up some of the principles. Next slide, please. Um, so in that, so having, having said that just transition is that there are a variety of different visions of just transition on the, on the table, I wanted to share the results of a series of workshops that we did in 2019 with movements, um, with labor movements and environmental justice activists from uh, Nigeria, South Africa, Europe and South America. And we got together to formulate a couple of core principles of just transition. So these are not, not everybody's principles, but these were a set that we, um, we came together on. So the first kind of critical point, and I think this is very relevant for when we're thinking about regional perspectives, is that just transition will look different in every place. What it means will depend on where you are and what the current injustices are that you're confronting. Uh, Across, across spaces and regions, though, just transition is a, a class issue. It's a class-based perspective that puts the needs of workers and communities at the center above the needs of uh, corporations and shareholders, roughly. Um, it is a gender issue, and Farah will speak more about this, but it takes an explicitly feminist analysis and does so especially by focusing on the role of reproductive labor and of care work um, of all the often unpaid and often gendered work that keeps our society ticking along. Um, it's also an anti-racist framework. It recognizes that environmental harms and benefits are often uh, distributed along racialized lines today and that that, that needs to be addressed uh, in order to have a more just system. It's about more than the climate, so it doesn't focus narrowly on emissions, but on a, a broad vision of environmental justice that incorporates uh, biodiversity and other kinds of environmental regeneration. And very fundamentally, it's about democracy. It says that we need to shift not only our, our energy sources, for example, but we need to shift power in our society. And that means asking the questions of energy for what and for whom, what are we using energy for? Um, and same goes in our food systems and so on, and about building systems where people can directly and democratically control these. Uh, next slide, please. And I hope you will wave at me if I'm hugely over time. <laughs> um, I wanted to touch on just a few examples of some ways that other movements around the world have been using or articulating concepts of just transition. Um, the first one is a, a kind of a regional process which has taken place in, in Latin America. And this really, uh, this process, which now uses just transition as a large part of its kind of framing and language, but it originates in the struggles um, against the free trade area of the Americas. So it started with a focus on yeah, neoliberal trade dynamics. And then through that kind of struggle and resistance, uh, an alliance was built between trade unions, especially the trade and environmental justice movements, to start articulating their own visions of what development should look like um, and their own visions of just transition. So this took place through, um, through an ongoing series of annual mobilizations, which are called the Jornada Continental. And then it also took the format of articulating uh, what is called PLATA, the Platform for Alternative Development in the Americas. So really shaping a vision of, from the perspectives of working people and movements, what does it mean to, to develop um, in the region and putting forward, I'll say, quite a different vision than a mainstream neoliberal development vision. 
Um, a second case that I think is worth um, worth flagging and is a kind of prominent international case is South Africa. Uh, there's a quite a powerful coalition of movement using the language of, of just transition here, and that's in the context most especially of their really um, collapsing national electric utility, which was a public utility designed to provide affordable energy for industry uh, and for people, but has been in what's usually referred to as a death spiral uh, for some, some years now, and is really failing to meet the needs of, of people, uh, but also triggering a kind of increasing economic um, crisis, the huge unemployment, et cetera. So there's a number of uh, kind of visions being contested now about how that um, how that company should be reformed or, or eliminated with a quite a large public push to to liberalize privatize the the whole energy sector in South Africa. The movements working towards a just transition are really arguing that instead that um, that company needs to be transformed and made back into a, a genuine public service in the service of people. Then for just a, yeah, for the last one, I wanted to draw a bit of attention to the framing um, of the Indigenous Environmental Network. And this is work that's been done by Indigenous communities and movements across North America, trying to articulate for their context what a just transition would look like. So they elaborated another set of principles of just transition, longer, uh, longer than ours, um, aligned in many ways, but really putting a focus on the need to um, on the sort of the spiritual dimensions, the need to transform our relationships with nature, and the need to valorize and validate indigenous knowledge. So these are sort of very different things that just transition right might mean, right? From a, a regional development program to a set of quite technical national uh, policies for, um, for driving a transformation in the sector, uh, to a really broad vision of social transformation in line with just transition. Uh, the next three slides are just pictures uh, from those three movements, so you can skip through kind of quickly. <laughs> um, some things that you might be interested to read. Fine, one more, yep. Um, yeah, so I wanted to close with just a couple of very, um, very open and very initial questions here that I think, hope, might be relevant in the, in the coming couple of days. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so in the context of, um, of the MENA region, I think there are a couple of important questions that can be relevant to, yeah, to breaking down that question of, is the concept of just transition relevant? How could it be relevant? What might a regional vision on just transition look like that could be useful? Uh, and what kind of coalitions could it involve? So these are sort of sub questions to that <laughs> that question. Um, I think the the first one is what kind of workers and what kinds of work are we thinking of when we talk about just transition? So I spoke about just transition as as being a framework that puts workers and communities um, at the center, but in really most of the world outside of Western Europe. Um, a great deal of work is done in informal markets, is done precariously, uh, is done by people who are yeah, migrant, temporary, informal workers. So that's very different than the context that originally gave birth to, to Just Transition, which was this unionized labor. Um, and what we've uh, found with our partners, this was especially identified in Nigeria as an issue, is that you know unionized workers often in fossil fuels, often men, um, are really a very privileged class of labor. So the question of how you can build coalitions between these you know, workers in fossil fuel sectors, for example, and all of the other workers in, in society and what that would mean and what that would look like um, is, I think, a big question for, for just transition everywhere, uh, but I think also <laughs> in this region. So what is the role of, of temporary migrant informal work and of care workers and of reproductive work? Uh, the second one, uh, another small question, is uh, what is the role that people see for the state in a just transition? I spoke a little bit about the, the South African context where there's a really big call for making a public or remaking a public utility. They see a very strong role for the state and are advocating for one million climate jobs for South Africa, which would be really driven by government investment. But obviously that kind of strategy depends uh, a lot 
on the the kind of state that you're that you're located in uh, and where people are in occupied territories where people are in authoritarian states or undemocratic states what kinds of possibilities are there or do we need to think um, instead really about just transitions that are driven from blow uh, and with a, a less prominent role for the state and the government and then on the last one um, I wanted to yeah raise a little bit the question of the linkages with Europe because as I think everybody uh, knows there's a huge potential for for green energy in North Africa and the Middle East um, and the EU is extremely interested in this and EU if you look at EU action plans on on energy they are really planning to get a significant proportion of their green energy from especially North Africa there's big developments in in solar and in green hydrogen being pushed to facilitate this uh, so I think there's a, a question there about how yeah, what, what are the possibilities for that to uh, be a benefit to the region? What are the, the risks associated with that? Um, and what are the, the kind of conditions that might allow it to, might allow green energy developments to be actually beneficial in the region in terms of meeting people's energy needs? Um, yeah, but also driving economic development. So those are three uh, <laughs> quite big questions, but that I hope will connect to some of the discussions in the coming days and offer a little bit of, of food for thought. But I'm very much looking forward to hearing from all of you in the yeah in the coming sessions. Great, thank you so much, Kathy. Yes, I think it's working, right? Success. Um, thank you for that uh, tour de force uh, through uh, the history of the concept and also bringing us the experiences from other regions of the world. As um, Nadim was uh, speaking in his introductory remarks, this is something we're trying to do a lot of to position our region in conversation with other global south movements um, to learn from but also see what our region can bring um, to the discussion and how it changes those debates. Thank you also for ending with those uh, easy <laughs> three questions. Um, so the second one on the state, I think is one that is, that is uh, transversal, that is going to be popping up in all of our discussions throughout the next three days. Um, your last one on energy, we are very excited later uh, tomorrow to have a, a, to a one panel dedicated to the question of energy transition in North Africa specifically. Um, so for those of you interested, um, that, that's when we'll have that discussion. And of course, the geopolitical connotations that you raise, especially in the context of North Africa and Europe, are some that we're going to uh, also address at that panel. As for your first question on workers, it's the perfect transition to Ali Aznag. Um, our second speaker, who is here um, from a, with a food sovereignty background, but also um, in doing so, thinking from the perspective of agricultural workers, but also workers in fisheries. Um, so we are moving, I guess, to one type of worker, um, a very critical one in these concepts of, of transition and moving a little bit uh, from concept to practice to one example of a coalition in the making, a uh, trans-regional one. So Ali, tfadal. Donc, euh, shukran. Euh, shukran lakum, ala da'wa awana fi mubadarat islah al-arabi. Uh, Thank you so much uh, for uh, inviting me to uh, this Adab Reform uh, Initiative. My name is uh, Ali Aznag, uh, and my uh, intervention will be about uh, the uh, alliances that we can build in the MENA region regarding the so regarding the environmental transition now in the arab region we have multinational companies we have uh, big companies that invest in uh, agro uh, business and in the energy sector especially in the arab uh, region and uh, the uh, environmental transition is another uh, spot of or zone of uh, conflict for all the companies that uh, invest their monies in the energy sector or uh, 
in uh, the maritime sector or so on. So, and all that, if you want to see true results, we are going to expect the real struggles and the good alliances with the other opposing movements and the countering movements for the, the yeah, capitals, the financial capitals of this. Uh, uh, these companies, in addition to other alliances with NGOs, with CSOs, there with the associations, with uni unions, and so on. So we are going now to talk about the Arab regions as a um, uh, a region that lacks sovereignty. No. I was saying, why do we want to build alliances in the BINA region for a just uh, environmental transition? Because we have a true battle going on the ground between, the capi between capitalism and the victims of capitalism in the Arab region. I would like to give you a small idea about the MENA region as being a, uh, a region that lacks sovereignty. So lately, during the uh, uh, so lately and recently, our uh, region uh, has uh, known uh, real uh, development uh, when it comes to uh, uh, to development uh, and the growth. Uh, however, that meant uh, more uh, infiltration of uh, capitalism, uh, especially in the agricultural field. There are a lot of capitals, uh, capital influx over there, which meant that uh, social uh, uh, constructs and social structures uh, of uh, the villages of the rural areas that have been uh, destroyed and the agriculturals or farmers were, uh, 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 were driven away from their fields. And that meant also that uh, Capital, capitalist relationships have been uh, disseminated and that has led to a huge, uh, uh, and that was at the detriment of uh, the environment, whether we're talking about the sea, whether we're talking about the soil uh, or uh, so on, we are producing what we do not consume and we consume what we do not uh, produce which means that we are importing uh, more than exporting and therefore it has led to a um, uh, an uh, imbalance of uh, the uh, uh, 
of the balance uh, sheet. Uh, this has also led to an increase of uh, debt, especially that uh, we had also to uh, uh, submit ourselves to the conditions of the donors. That means more uh, submission, more uh, uh, and uh, right now we can see that there are uh, many economic agreements that are unfair to the Arab world, such in uh, Tunisia, for example, and so on. Everything related to structural reform has led to us becoming a region lacking all kinds of uh, sovereignty. So this has this means that uh, as uh, activists that uh, and people concerned with this uh, matter, since we are all concerned with uh, building more alliances to counter uh, the economic and social uh, and negative effects of the uh, this uh, whole issue and this whole circumstance we need to build alliances what we mean by building alliances we need to gather forces we need to cooperate and coordinate in order to struggle in order to fight for our cause what is the purpose of uh, these alliances especially in our region. The main purpose is to build a pole that would counterbalance. It must be, of course, quite effective. It should have its own weight in order to counterbalance the, as we said, the negative effects of capitalism. We need to build more alliances from uh, with the grassroots uh, associations and so on in order to build a better uh, uh, working and uh, or labor and popular resistances. The, purpose also is to have a different narrative, to have a, an alternative narrative that would liberate the small producers of food and that would resist new uh, this new kind of um, uh, occupation and this new kind of colonialism. The main purpose remains that to counter this uh, attack against uh, the MENA region, we need to stay united. We need to defend the victims of capitalism. There are many examples that uh, could lead us, like for example, when, uh, like for example, in Tunisia, where uh, a, uh, an activist group uh, was uh, trying to and managed actually to uh, counter and to stand uh, uh, its ground in front of uh, many capitalist uh, organizations and capitalist companies. And there, the uh, agriculture and the farmers were ex exploited and everything uh, that uh, was uh, cultivated was uh, dedicated for exports, not for imports. And regarding this alliance, also there is something very important. We should never separate between the causes because all the causes are the same, are one and the same, whether we're talking about the economic, social, uh, political, or environmental causes, they are one and the same. As for our experience, Regarding food sovereignty, we have uh, different uh, pillars for uh, common work in uh, uh, SIADA network. So we were trying to uh, tighten cooperation relationships uh, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, activist uh, relationships against the new colonialist uh, agreements. So we were talking about that uh, on and on. We were discussing it over and over again, 
especially with our partners who share our same vision, our same purposes and goals in order to build true and real environmental alternatives in our region. Also, we were talking about independence where we always work with the non-governmental uh, uh, parties. It doesn't mean that we are isolated as a network. No, we are quite open to working with all the partners, working for the same purpose and same goal. Our other principle is to present an alternative an alternative that would be anti-capitalism and that can only be a progressive uh, project for the victims of capitalism. The fourth principle of uh, this alliance would be to have a wide uh, public. We need to organize the small producers of food and to make them partners in our world and to make them partner in the decision-making process. We cannot be uh, merely uh, spokespersons for them. We should not uh, speak on behalf of them. We need to speak with them. We need to address them and we need to try as much as possible and to the limit of our capabilities to uh, uh, raise awareness among them. Also, when we're talking about building alliances in the Arab region, this is something very difficult. It's complicated, it's thorny, and we have many challenges that uh, may uh, that we may face. One of the most important challenges is the political circumstances of a number of countries, Arab countries. Uh, we've seen that have erupted lately, for example, in Yemen, in Syria, in Iraq, in Libya. So we have many countries that are suffering from many political tensions and this is one of the main hurdles uh, on our way. We have another challenge which is uh, the dict dictatorships of our countries which not only oppress the people but they also cancel all kinds and uh, of the freedoms and deny them. We have a, an activist, a fellow activist called the Muhad Qasimi who was who was leading activities against uh, a, a certain kind of gas shale gas and uh, he was arrested just because he was uh, leading these uh, this kind of activity and activism against shale gas we have another challenge, which is the fact that uh, the state apparatus is quite infiltrated in the CSOs and in the civil society. And that means that uh, it leaves us with less and less real alternatives. And as we said, it is a great challenge for us. Another challenge is the fact that in our region we don't have this tradition of cooperation in our uh, uh, fight, in our activism activity. We don't really work together. This is not something enshrined in our culture and traditions. I am not going to go into the details regarding the possibilities and capabilities. I'm going to say that we are one people, we are one region. And uh, the, one of the examples, I'm going to give you a few examples about solidarity between transnational uh, activism. Uh, activism. First of all, we try to raise awareness among the population regarding alternatives. We try to promote 
for alternatives that would counter the false uh, information, the misinformation and disinformation that is quite rampant through CSOs and NGOs. We try to organize the solidarity campaigns, like, for example, the one we organized to show our solidarity with the farmers of India. And we also translate the different documents and the uh, literature regarding this matter. We keep organizing solidarity campaigns, like such as the one we did uh, regarding Muhad Qasimi, we try also to show always our solidarity and we do show our solidarity with the union of the farming work in Palestine, in uh, Tunisia, and so on. As for the partners of the network, in this uh, activism uh, sector, we work and we cooperate with different organizations that are directly uh, uh, interested in uh, this issue. Like, for example, the union of the fishermen in Morocco with uh, other labor unions in uh, Sudan, in Mauritania, and the, with the small farmers of Mauritania. These are our partners. We also work with progressive uh, associations that are interested in agriculture and environment uh, in general. We are open to working and cooperating with the researchers, with activists, uh, and we work also and cooperate with other international movements such uh, La Via Campesina, AFSA, and uh, we are members of the CADTM uh, network, which is the, the uh, uh, national network, uh, international network to cancel that. As uh, for uh, the lessons learned from other people's experiences, this is uh, quite a rich field because we believe that all the battles that are waged for uh, a just environmental transition are ours and we believe that any battle no matter how small it is in the arab region is an important battle for us whether we're talking about morocco about lebanon or sudan or any other country of the arab region we are very interested and very keen on participating and taking part in any one of these uh, battles we also try to streamline, to spread the, the news about the victories. We try to learn lessons from the cases we lose. We try to also learn from other people's experiences on uh, different matters, such as uh, the environment, uh, such as uh, renewable energy and uh, uh, Aboriginal uh, and uh, the uh, uh, um, the other experiences of Latin America and so on. We also seek to show and express our solidarity with uh, the other uh, with other associations, organizations. منظمات عمالية شبابية نسوانية كذلك هناك إمكانيات واسعة جدا للالتقاء الميداني والنضال على قضايا مشتركة مطالب اجتماعية ونضالات وعمالات شعبية إلى آخره كذلك هناك إمكانية الالتقاء مع حركات بيئية للنضال يعني ضد هذه التغيرات المناخية ومن أجل السيادة الغذائية كذلك نحن نؤمن بأن هناك فكرة جوهرية في مسألة البيئة وخصوصا في, جم... في, يعني في كل محاور اللي نشتغل عليها هي لا يمكن الانتصار بدون work together unless we agree on the same, on, on the same common core points.
thank you. Thank you, Ali. Thank you uh, for this intervention. Uh, we will talk about food sovereignty. We will talk about uh, further details in our third session, mainly about the small scale producers of food. But uh, allow me to remind you before giving the floor to the other speakers that you can ask your questions on Zoom and on Facebook uh, in the Q&A section. So we can start writing down your question. Uh, two ideas that Ali talked about that are very important. I think that uh, this allows us uh, to uh, move uh, to fast intervention. I'm talking mainly about uh, the importance of gathering all topics together and working on all topics together and the importance of finding an alternative rhetoric uh, or speech. And I think that it is very important to agree on an alternative discourse or rhetoric if we truly want to succeed. So Farah, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Julia. I'm extremely happy to be present among you today. I'm sorry, but I will speak in English because it's easier for me. Um, we at FES or Friedrich Ebert Stiftung uh, believe that there is no uh, environmental justice without social justice and there is no social justice without gender justice. Um, our political feminism program in the MENA region has been focusing on the intersections between uh, uh, patriarchy, capitalism and ecology uh, from various points of view. Uh, I will try to focus my intervention today on uh, the areas that uh, I think would benefit the, this discussion on, on alliance building. To start, I would like to clarify what I mean by the links between patriarchy, capitalism and ecology and uh, why we believe that a feminist uh, uh, perspective or um, even a socialist eco-feminist perspective can provide uh, um, an analysis framework and a roadmap to a just uh, uh, environmental transition in the region. Um, there is a codependent relationship between uh, the different oppressive systems and this is definitely applicable for uh, capitalism and patriarchy as well as, of course, you know, racism, imperialism, colonialism. Um, this codependency has greatly influenced our global socio-economic and political order, uh, uh, establishing hierarchies that um, deliberately place money, men, often white men, uh, uh, and hyper-masculinity at the top of the pyramid. The most pressing issues facing the region can all be uh, analyzed from this point of view social and gender uh, disparities, climate change, uh, militarism, authoritarianism uh, are all a direct result of this, of this uh, arrangement. Um, I'll give a few examples here just to clarify what I mean. So if we look at the exploitation of labor, for example, we know that uh, uh, capitalism exploits the labor force for the benefit of the few who you know, owns the, mean, uh, the means of production. Um, but we also know that under capitalism, all men are still more privileged than women as they traditionally earn an income for the uh, labor that they perform, while women were given the task of uh, uh, performing unpaid care labor uh, at home. This limits you know, the resources of women, keeps them in, in, under the control of uh, uh, men, um, and of course confines them to the private sphere, uh, all uh, for the benefit of the uh, patriarchal uh, system, of course. But capitalism also greatly benefits from this arrangement. Although ca unpaid care work um, uh, is worth 10.8 trillion US dollars annually, globally, and this is three times the size of the um, world's tech industry, um, it is yet to be recognized as work and adequately evaluated. As a free service that is provided for the uh, capitalist system, uh, reproducing the workers, Unpaid care work uh, also subsidizes the low wages of all workers, exempting the private sphere or the state from covering care costs uh, or providing adequate care services. Um, I'll, I'll shift the perspective a bit and let's look, for example, at the links between climate change and patriarchy, militarism, masculinity uh, and capitalism. Um, we see here that patriarchy has played a pivotal role in, in the degradation of the environment um, in support of, of capitalism in many ways. 
For example, um, through the uh, decrease of the value of what is stereotypically seen as feminine, like compassion, gentleness, empathy, humility, while also uh, increasing the value of what is stereotypically perceived as masculine, like aggression, dominance, uh, uh, independence, and assertiveness, um, traits that are essential for us to connect with nature, care for it, and live in harmony with its diverse species became a threat to modern day masculinity. Despite the countless movements that uh, uh, call for changing the system, men are refraining from adopting the environmental movement at the rates that women are. On a micro level, studies show that um, uh, men are more prone to stick with environmentally damaging habits, uh, they recycle less, litter more, and leave a larger carbon footprint when compared to women. Um, this is across the globe. Uh, and the latter, of course, links to the fact that men have more resources due to the patriarchal system that allow them to leave a larger footprint. Um, while on a macro level, uh, rich men in power have little to no interest in truly addressing the climate catastrophe we are facing. Uh, let alone the root causes of this catastrophe. They still lead with capitalist patriarchal values, prioritizing socio-economic and political control and dominance, and they do so with absolute impunity. Um, if we look at military pollution, and here I would like to note that we see militarism as a manifestation of, of hyper-masculinity that is promoted by capitalism and patriarchy. Military pollution is uh, currently excluded from climate agreements globally. Uh, militaries are not required to uh, report on their emissions, uh, let alone, you know, reduce, the, uh, reduce them. Uh, and this is, uh, uh, although, for example, the US uh, uh, military is the single largest consumer of fossil fuel and oil in the world. At the same time, in the context of uh, war and conflict, um, women and girls' bodies, as well as uh, uh, intentional environmental damage, are used as weapons of war to advance militarized interests, interests that are you know, driven by uh, dominance, power, and control, all of which are capitalist and patriarchal values. Um, and of course, this links to other issues like the military-industrial complex and other areas which I will not go into now. What I'm trying to say is that um, the exploitation of women and the exploitation of the environment are very much interlinked. Um, the violence exerted against both uh, uh, are not byproducts of the capitalist patriarchal system, but are actually a precondition to its functionality and growth. From that perspective, we realize that um, we need to not only look at the gendered impacts of, of climate change, focusing on uh, um, the fact that women and girls uh, will be the most negatively, are and will be the most negatively affected by the climate crisis um, due to you know, existing discrimination, exploitation and oppression, and use that as the uh, um, base for uh, a feminist environmental alliance. But we actually need to use a feminist lens to analyze the crises facing the region and look at how feminist principles and approaches can be used as a tool uh, uh, to create and realize a just environmental uh, uh, transition that is built on the values of care, solidarity, coexistence and respect. And within that context, we cannot deny that an anti-capitalist slash anti-patriarchal struggle can and must unify labor, environmental and feminist movements in the region. But what does that mean in practical terms? And um, here I would like to give an example, uh, um, to give the degrowth movement uh, uh, um, example. Um, degrowth is a global movement that aims to reconstruct societies and economies with the goal of mitigating crises. The movement is not one that promotes negative uh, growth or recession within a growth paradigm, but um, rather aims to liberate societies from the dependency on, on economic growth. There is now a feminist degrowth alliance um, that aims to incorporate feminist principles in the foundations of a degrowth society. The movement calls for centering life within economic systems, democratizing societies, radically re-evaluating work, organizing societies around essential services and goods, 
uh, and building an economic and political system uh, uh, on the principles of solidarity. So in practical terms that apply to the region. First, this means that we need to re-evaluate the concept of work and the myth and bust the myth that only the productive is valuable. And this is especially the case for care work uh, um, or social reproduction. Of course, feminist economists has been, have been working towards this goal for a century. Um, this also includes the recognition of farmers and domestic workers, many of whom are women, uh, as workers within uh, different countries in the region where they are not recognized as of yet, providing them with adequate uh, labor rights and, and uh, protections. This also includes the need to reconstruct social protection mechanisms uh, beyond traditional schemes, uh, um, including care workers, seasonal workers, part-time workers, etc. Second, we need to dismantle all the hierarchies that were instilled by capitalist patriarchy, from placing humans over the natural world to valuing the masculine more than the feminine and the, and the productive more than the reproductive. And to recognize at a social level the interconnectedness, as Ali said, of uh, uh, oppressive systems and thus how fostering one system like patriarchy while calling for an end to another like capitalism does not work. Third, we need, to, uh, we need an anti-capitalist, anti-neoliberal approach. Um, Katie touched based on this as well. Um, and to focus mainly on improving housing, education, health services, and other sectors like uh, uh, transportation and renewable, uh, renewable energy. Um, fourth, we need to display transnational solidarity uh, through implementation of the uh, principles of self-determination and cooperation. And here I would like to note that um, just like countries uh, have the right for, uh, to self-determination, uh, individuals like women <laughs> Uh, must attain that right in the process. And finally, we need to uh, truly redistribute resources and power through legal, social, cultural change, um, taking into consideration the multi-layered oppression that many individuals face based on their gender, race, class, geographical location, uh, uh, and so on. This includes, for instance, supporting tax justice and the democratization of all decision-making processes. Um, and before I end, I will uh, um, just maybe mention a challenge that I see uh, uh, that we all need to be uh, aware of or keep in mind. Um, if we truly uh, uh, want to create a, a unified movement uh, that calls for a just transition beyond all systems of oppression, then we need other movements to truly see feminism as a legitimate political project and a partner and an ally that is capable of offering practical just alternatives. I think a vital first step uh, uh, towards just environmental transition is the recognition that the, the, the devastation of the environment and the oppression of women are both rooted in hyper-masculinist mentality that is driven by economic and personal gain. The environmental crisis is undoubtedly the biggest challenge that humanity has ever faced and it requires truly radical solutions and feminism already has a lot of the answers. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Farah. Uh, you can clap, it's okay. <laughs> I hear a shy clapping. <laughs> Thank you, Farah, for this perspective, which, um, uh, as you mentioned, not only um, makes us think about how uh, about the gendered impact of these crises, meaning how uh, women might be uh, or are more negatively affected by men in the context of this just transition of who does, uh, not everybody is going to be equally affected by climate, but also in taking us on a conceptual journey through a gendered lens. What, does, what happens when we look through feminism at the climate crisis, at environmental change? So thank you for that. Uh, you also brought up uh, the issue of militarism, and I bring it up now now as a transition to our um, last speaker, uh, Sarmad Amjad from uh, Iraq. So uh, you specifically mentioned the question of military pollution. Uh, in his presentation, Ali also asked the question of, um, 
or posed it as a challenge of how do we talk about these issues in active violent conflict, which unfortunately is very prevalent and increasingly more prevalent in our region. Uh, in our program, at uh, the Environmental Politics Program, we try very hard to think about these questions in the, in the context of conflict as well. Um, it's not easy, but it's uh, we certainly didn't want to uh, ignore uh, the situation in those settings, and uh, that's why we are very happy that Sarmad uh, could join us today. Um, so, Sarmad, without further ado. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, is it, yeah. First of all, I would like to apologize for any noise coming from back. That's my son. <laughs> he is eager to come to listen and to see the presentation. So, yeah, apologize on that. I'm going to talk in Arabic. حتى بما ان الاغلبيه موجودين العربي فخلينا نحكي بالعربي وي سويتش تو عابك ام سرمد اي ورك وذ باكس باكس فور بيس اتس دوت اورجنايزيشن فروم اوتريخ سو اي مانج the office, the Iraq office. We have an office in Erbil, in Iraq, and I'm the representative of the organization in Erbil. If any colleague would like to visit Erbil, I would be more than happy uh, to uh, welcome you in our offices. Thank you for hosting me. Thank you for your invitation. Thank you for organizing this conference. I will be talking mainly about how conflict, mainly conflicts in Iraq and in the Arab region, since we have similar contacts, so how these conflicts impact the environment, the society, different communities, and what about environmental uh, transition, just environmental transition here. In Iraq, we started recently working on transitional justice. We've worked with PACS, GIZ, the UNDP. Many organizations and many institutions started working on transitional justice in the country. In Iraq, our experience might be different. And I would like to talk about my experience before talking about environment and about the connection between uh, the conflicts in general and environment. We're not working only on transitional justice, but on transformative justice. Not transitional, but transformative justice. The difference between transitional and transformative justice, in our opinion, and based on our experience, Mainly, mainly from Bosnia. So transitional justice is more about legal procedures, legal frameworks, working with the government, governance in general. In Iraq, uh, we uh, lost faith, if we could say so, in working with the government. Uh, with governmental reforms. So let's say we're facing many challenges in our relationship with the system. This is why we decided to work on uh, the weaker point, if you could say so, which is the community. We decided to start working with the community, with the local communities. And based on our experience, we noticed that working with local communities, with societies, is way more uh, fruitful and beneficial than working with the government because we can uh, notice the fruits uh, of, uh, of this work, of, this, of these activities uh, fast. How can we work with the communities on transformative justice? In Iraq, our context might be different than yours. In Iraq, in fact, we've had two types of transitional justice. First, after the fall of the Ba'ath regime, and recently, after the, the, the different terrorist attacks of Qaeda, Daesh, and other terrorist organizations. 
So, our context might be different, but what is truly different between our context and other regions and other countries is that uh, in the framework of this justice, as we all know, uh, there are the victims and there are the perpetrators. But in Iraq, the perpetrators and the victims were clear. In the second phase, we had the same victims that became perpetrators. So it's quite complicated for us. Our context is it's quite complicated. How can we deal with a group of people that were victims in the first phase and that became perpetrators and criminals in the second phase? We decided, therefore, to work with the activists, with the local organizations, with the local communities, grassroots organizations, those who are active on the ground, uh, heads of tribes, tribal leaders, community leaders, and we decided to work with the victims themselves. So we have a victims-centered approach. We listen to the victims. The aim of our work mainly is to hopefully prepare the communities to become more resilient more flexible to be able to face any extremist organization and any conflict so that we can learn from the past lessons and so that we do not perpetrate the same kinds of conflicts and types of conflicts in the future. This is our aim, build more resilient communities, communities that are able to face any future conflict. Our aim is to reinforce institutions, empower institutions and organizations so that we do not witness the same conflicts in the future. In addition, we are working with different communities so that they become more empowered and they do not take sides in conflicts. So not help one component at the expense of the other, just because they have the same sectarian, confessional, or religious belonging or identity. We will be working, and we have already worked with victims on compensation. Compensation is a major pillar uh, of uh, this uh, justice, transitional justice. So how can we achieve justice for these victims? How can we design programs to which victims have access, programs that help victims amplify their voices and raise their voices so that everyone gets to hear what they have to say, so that the government, the leaders get to hear the victims' voices. We know that we have many displaced in, uh, in Iraq and we still have many IDPs. Uh, so those are victims and those lack security. They do not have a sense of security inside their country. Well, I will be linking this to environment as well. As you all know, in general, conflicts, as my colleagues just said and as Farah just said, are influenced by military interventions. And military inter interventions have a direct impact on the environment. Under Daesh rule, Many crimes, many environmental crimes have been perpetrated. For example, oil fields were burned to ground. We had many water pumps that were stolen and irrigation was affected. Many agricultural equipment was destroyed as well. So Daesh perpetrated many attacks against the environment. Chemical weapons were used as well. After that, and after the liberation from Daesh, when Mosul was liberated from Daesh, we have witnessed many environmental crimes as well. There were interventions 
that weren't well calculated from foreign forces or Iraqi forces. So NATO forces, Iraqi forces. Many attacks, many heavy weapons have negatively affected the environment, and we might be seeing long-term effects of these weapons practically on the ground. Military intervention, uh, when uh, liberating different regions from Daesh, have had an impact on industrial zones and agricultural zones. So industrial and agricultural zones have been affected. I don't know if my colleague is uh, with us online. He was supposed to participate in the conference, but I guess he couldn't attend in person, so he's with us online. Uh, so my colleague from PAX. Uh, but I would like to tell you on his behalf that PAX, as Farah was uh, just saying, works uh, on reporting. We know that the military uh, doesn't file reports about the environmental impact of their acts practically on the ground. So, so we have to do that as activists, as environmental activists, and as organizations working practically on the ground. We cannot uh, but uh, monitor the environmental impact of uh, military uh, conflicts on the ground. We do that uh, thanks to the latest techniques available. And my colleague is the one in charge of uh, uh, developing or writing uh, the monthly uh, reports and uh, presenting them to different uh, international entities and organizations. Also, right now, there is quite a strong conflict or a fierce con conflict at the borders between Iraq and uh, Turkey, between the PKK and uh, the Turkish uh, uh, forces, army forces. So that's at uh, the border of Iraq, and that has uh, hugely affected Iraq. And the zone there, because under the pretext uh, that uh, they were uh, trying to uh, or cut new roads for uh, the army uh, uh, forces, they were uh, deforesting, there. they were uh, cutting the trees also. They have affected the, the lives of uh, the farmers over there, and they had a direct negative impact on the agricultural lands over there. So through this uh, monitoring that we do in Iraq, we try to diagnose these uh, matters and these issues, and we try to support them with evidence and with data. We even use that for uh, advocacy, uh, using the advocacy-based evidence method. Right now, the work we do in Iraq includes uh, trainings that we are going to conduct and organize for partner uh, uh, associations and organizations uh, regarding climate uh, change and how uh, these uh, partners can uh, regionally and locally monitor the effect of uh, these uh, uh, army interventions and even when it comes to uh, the water scarcity matter, I'm going to see that in the next session. Unfortunately, this is going to greatly affect the uh, the uh, water sovereignty of Iraq. In uh, Iraq, uh, we have five to six times uh, we have dust uh that invades everything basically and this is a negative uh, indicator regarding desertification in uh, kurdistan we used to notice that or to experience that two times only 
each uh, summer. However, now we've been witnessing it uh, more and more and more frequently, like four to five times uh, in one month. This is something that is quite dangerous, so that is uh, quite critical because at the end there is no border between the countries when it comes to the environment. The environment knows no border, a border and climate change knows no border. The same uh, as that, we are going to be organizing trainings for our partners in Syria on monitoring and uh, studies and so on. We are going to build alliances between local and international partners, especially those with the uh, who have a lot of experience in this matter. And this is what we are going to address in this conference on behalf of PACS. We welcome any kind of uh, cooperation at the level of the MENA region regarding advocacy campaigns, advocacy uh, alliances, the, uh, information sharing experiences also. Everything we have, all the experience we have, it is at your service. We are ready to share it with you. And I am not going to take more of your time. Thank you so much for this kind opportunity. Thank you, Sarmad. Thank you for uh, tackling these uh, two uh, topics regarding uh, a transitional uh, justice and the environmental uh, transitional justice. We wanted, we know that these are two different topics, but we wanted to speak to someone who's worked on that topic and we wanted to ask them directly, do the activists in these uh, uh, activists working on these topics, are they getting anywhere and we noticed that uh, through detailed monitoring of uh, these uh, environmental communities we noticed that uh, there are uh, uh, so there are many challenges and you can ask them in english or arabic as you prefer and as we uh, wait for those we are happy to take questions here from the floor from uh, the participants who are here physically today um, we will pass around mics. Is this what we'll do? Or, or actually, yeah, please, um, if you're not sitting at a table, come close to one of the tables and use the mic so that our Zoom participants can hear you. And please introduce yourself uh, before your question. Thank you. Uh, you can press on the button. Uh, hello. Okay. Yeah, um, hi everyone. Thank you so much for this great discussion um, about climate justice. My name is Zrayan Qasim. Uh, I wear many hats representing different organizations, including the United Nations. Uh, but I'm here to talk uh, or to represent specifically youth-led um, initiatives about climate justice. I hope I'm not the only person representing youth-led um, movements here about climate justice. Anyway, um, when Katie was talking about uh, principles, uh, in specific, as a youth-led organization called Youth for Nature, uh, we came here in West Asia and we, we try to take action for climate justice, especially for, for young people in specific. Um, and what we realized is that these principles do not exist in West Asia in specific. Uh, hence is our m mission now over 2022-2023 with the COP27 and COP28 coming up to gather as much or to, um, to capture the understandings and perspectives of young people about what climate justice means to them, given that there is no globally defined term. Uh, so they need to come up with their own principles and we need to capture those understandings so that we can take action. Because if we take action and say, oh, this is climate just, um, according to who, you know, who, who said this is climate just if we don't have shared principles and understandings. So my purpose of visiting you here today in person is to ask you if you're gonna take an initiative to gather these principles, we as a youth-led organization and having all of our youth-led partners want to partner up with you so that we don't reinvent the wheel. 
Uh, so yeah, it's just my question. Do you have this initiative ongoing? And as youth, we'd like to, you know, join hands in hands uh, with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, should we take a few more and then open it up for discussion? Um, okay, we'll go to Nadim Houdi and then we'll go to a question from Zoom. أول شيء شكرا ل يعني بانل فتح عدة أسئلة ما تدعو أنك كثير تنتناقش في ال ال يومين ثلاثة. Thank you for the panel that has opened the doors for many discussions. I am Nadim Houri from the Arab Reform Initiative. While I was listening to you, I had different questions and interventions that popped up to my mind. The first one was regarding the role of the state or the government, especially in our region. It's a big challenge when we're talking about these struggles, when we're talking about activism. What will be the role of the country, of the state in, uh, uh, in, uh, in light of the lack of any kind of a social contract? That does not mean that we have uh, that we have alternatives regarding grass, grassroots organizations, but we're or uh, activism, but this is something that should be uh, food for thought. How should we think, how should we consider that? How should we look at the, the state, the, the role of the state? How much should they interfere or intervene? I think this is one of the greatest challenges that pose themselves in our region. The other uh, question or uh, issue is timing. We always think about uh, the uh, convergence of the struggles or fights or activism, which means how can we unite all these uh, activism uh, initiatives and uh, processes? The problem is that we have different timings. Salmad was talking about different matters, but I think that we need all kinds of struggle, all kinds of activism. For example, if we're talking about women, the labor law accepts uh, uh, domestic uh, workers and farmers from uh, social uh, protection. So it's been 50 years now that we have failed to include domestic workers and farmers from, uh, so not social protection, but rather from the labor law itself. At the same time, we notice that uh, the uh, climate change is faster than our capability, capability to organize ourselves in uh, activities and in uh, struggles and militancy. I think that uh, one of our challenges would be, can we set up our priorities? And when I'm saying priorities, I'm not talking about the main issues, about neutralizing main issues or putting aside made, uh, main issues. Like, for example, let's liberate uh, Palestine first, and then we will talk about feminism. We should not be committing the same mistakes, but I believe that at the same time, we should build these alliances, taking into consideration timing and how pressing it is. I think that we're going to be discussing these matters in detail later, but we need to ask also about the region. Are we one region and how, how uh, and, and this uh, Orient or this 11th uh, region, is it really that uh, resembled or similar to uh, North Africa when we're talking about uh, capitals also? Uh, we notice that in uh, North Africa, there is a lot of role played by uh, the European Union, but also by Gulf countries. For example, the United Arab Emirates have purchased the great lands and wide lands in uh, Sudan, for example. Also, they wanted to uh, purchase uh, more land in uh, the Bekaa Valley, and they were going to give uh, leftovers, basically, to the Lebanese. So we can see a lot of movements going on in different zones and in different spots of the MENA region. 
but we need to really work on zoning, on determining our territory or region. I'm not trying to add to our challenges, but I am trying to shed light on certain challenges and to see how the struggles are interconnected, basically. We need to look at our structural challenges too. Thank you very much, Nadine. We, so now when we're talking about the questions, we have uh, the role of the youth, we have the role of the government, uh, timing and the laws. No, first, let's go to Zoom. I'm going to read the questions from Zoom. We have two questions. The first one is addressed to everyone and the other one is addressed to Sadmad. The first one from Iyad Hussami. Then Iyad Hussami, perspectives from the toxicity of warfare to that of gender discrimination. The title of the conference situates a question of justice at the center of the debate. However, I wonder about the channels and methods to shift the ethics and advance a vision for ecological justice. What role do you see for education and culture in the struggle? So a question about education and culture. Thank you, Iyad. A second question for uh, Sarmad from Firas. After collecting data from the field about the environmental violations during wars, what actions do you then take? How do you see the role of the Iraqi government? And what do we need to encourage its role? OK. Can I Rabia? And then this is awesome. Thank you. I'm going to give you a chance. I'm going to give you a chance. I'm going to give you a chance. I just came. I just landed from Jordan. So my name is Rabia Wahba. I am part of the International Land Cooperation, and I am quite pleased to be working on building more alliances in the region for environmental justice. Of course, and just like my colleagues have already said, we have a lot of challenges, but we have to add another challenge related to the international financing institution, institutions because they have a critical role in building or destroying alliances. Because uh, at the spring conferences and meetings of the international uh, of the uh, World Bank, there are many changes in the narrative and the rhetoric regarding the environment the it's getting better but still the load that uh, the governments are feeling is quite heavy and uh, there is this kind of uh, giving in or surrender to uh, when it comes to uh, economic reform and the governments usually blame implicitly at least uh, the citizens this is why we need to take that into consideration at uh, the uh, earth uh, alliance we have two pledges work based or regarding transitional justice and defenders of human rights. So there is a need, an urgent need to reclaim the role of political activists after this, uh, after the Arab Spring, after the uh, different wars that erupted, there is the, a huge attack on attack on civil society activists. Uh, there is also a uh, uh, a certain dis uh, discord within the uh, civil society uh, field or uh, category. So we need to reclaim that role of the civil society also. Mr. Rabi Uthman, hello. My name is uh, Atman Awi from Morocco. I am the head of uh, Erzika Association in Morocco. Thank you so much for your invitation. And uh, it seems, and I have concluded based on the different interventions that the basis of any just 
uh, transition would be to build strong alliances, especially when it comes to the lobby forces in the civil society. But first, we need to push towards uh, opening borders and to have uh, common visas between the different MENA countries. So right now, we are working because the states now work on liberating the movement of goods, but they limit and restrict the movement of citizens. So in order to work on that, we need to work according to our social responsibility, the, the social responsibility of the organizations, which requires working on four bases or principles and with four poles. First of all, the state, which is responsible for any advancement and any transitional uh, justice, also working uh, on the soil uh, or earth uh, uh, organizations uh, or community. We have the civil society and uh, uh, so on. So, and without that, we cannot really have a complementary movement. So how can we work on that? First, in order to organize communities and societies through a good organization of uh, civil society, and also in order to make sure that the other parties are shouldering their responsibility. Because I've already, so the fourth pillar will be the uh, private sector. Thank you so much. Mr. Elias from Tunis. Hello. Elias Ben Ammar, I am a unionist. My question is addressed to Cathy because we work in our organization with unionist activities or union activities. So how can we work on union activities and this uh, just transition? also at the same time because when we look at our experience in Tun in tunisia and the the french experience we can have a few ideas about uh, just uh, about uh, just transition however in uh, france for example one of the taboos there is to talk about the abolishment of a nuclear uh, power and energy so even in Tunisia, we have this huge problematic one that we face as unionists. The labor, the workers, now that they are facing this economic uh, deterioration in Tunisia, those who work with the petrol companies, with the gas and electricity companies, with fossil fuel in general, because all these companies rely on fossil fuel, you can't really convince them on just transition and to relinquish their professional claims. Because many of the union bodies believe that uh, the mere fact that we're talking about uh, or talking about uh, just uh, transition is a luxury. So the question is, what is the role of political parties here? How can we converge? Or how can we establish this convergence between the civil society and the union activities? And this has happened before. And we've seen it, for example, in France, with the CGT, who is working on the progressive program uh, of energy, because I am unfortunately we don't have any Arab political parties here attending the conference. But how can we work on that? How can we have this kind of program that would join the forces of the civil society, political parties, and the uh, labor unions? So we still have seven minutes. Let's listen let's allow uh, so give the floor to our uh, panelists to answer the question um, okay i have a few points that are 
pertinent to everything you have asked. First of all, the late regarding the role of the state. From our point of view, and based on the feminist experience in the region, we know, and even the countries of the South. So lately, we have a depolitization of the feminist movement because of different factors and elements, like, for example, the state feminism and So here, we have to be very keen on the state environmentalism that is just like the state feminism in our countries that is uh, ruled and governed by dictatorship. They are going, the state is going to address uh, uh, address uh, uh, just transition from uh, the perspective of patriarchy and uh, capitalism. I remember that in COP26, many of the many heads of states who were talking about the military style campaigns against climate change and so on. So we need to make sure that uh, and to be keen on not giving the state the the capacity to be working on uh, social justice we also need to learn from the experiences of the feminists in this region and how they are reshaping feminism recently in the last few decades there was a lot of focus on uh, a project based work in general in general and most of the activism was based on the project also based on the dynamics of the donor community so we need to make sure that we are building an act a broad-based activism or broad-based militancy which works on the same issues but from a wider point of view and perspective in order to make sure that this activism is going to be sustainable also based on what ali said we need to tighten the gap between academia and uh, militancy and we need to diverse the actors in this movement in order to be able to build a social movement capable of pushing and pressuring to towards change i i'm not uh, my Arabic language is not uh, very strong. This is why I keep using English. So let's try to not try to change our rhetoric and to change our demands just to be accepted and tolerated by the uh, by the uh, political powers or authorities. So we need to have an unapologetic and intense rhetoric and narrative. Thank you very much. Okay, there are a lot of questions and I will try to be as brief as possible. The main questions, the role of the state. Personally, I think that the state has taken the side of the multinational capitalist companies who is allowing these companies to establish uh, their uh, grounds or uh, to establish uh, companies it's the state who is allowing these companies to uh, put their hand or to take basically these lands to the different uh, capitalist parties so it is the state that is totally biased it is uh, taking the side of uh, the capitalist companies uh, who is even uh, signing these different agreements these unjust agreements like for example the agreement that we saw the alka in uh, tunisia it is the state so and 
what we saw in Lebanon is actually the Lebanese answer to that in the Lebanese protest is uh, more than enough, which means all of them, which means all of them. We need them all out. This is what because all of them are benefiting from this situation. As for the laws, the laws are unjust in Lebanon and in Morocco also. The labor law is uh, not fair, it's unfair. Also, in Morocco, for example, they uh, disregard or they uh, uh, look down at uh, agricultural work and uh, it is not paid as much as other kind of works and labor. The same goes for uh, the different countries of the MENA because, and proof to that is uh, the Arab Spring. And it proves or it gives additional evidence to the fact that we are all suffering from the same problems as for uh, the international companies, international institutions, uh, World Bank, and so on. So these are uh, catastrophes, basically. Who is dictating structural uh, uh, reform and uh, or structural uh, changes and adaptations? It is uh, the World Bank, it is uh, the IMF, it is uh, the... Um, uh, internet World Trade Organization or International Trade Organization. So all that is being dictated and it is being assisted by the different banks, also international banks, whether we're talking about the Bank of Africa or Bank of Asia or so on. So all of them are part and parcel of this uh, process and uh, they have infiltrated everything. They are the root of all evil and they are the root of all our problems. And this is certain. And we can't counter that unless we build social movements on the ground, unless we build alliances in the MENA region and throughout the MENA region. And this is our role now. We need to examine and to study how we can build this kind of alliances because we don't have a recipe for that that's, uh, that could be applied on everyone. There are many missions that we need to shoulder, shoulder. There is a lot of experience sharing, information sharing, analysis sharing that we need to do. We need to organize more solidarity campaigns with the different uh, militancy movements around the Arab country and across the Arab country. And I believe that this is going to uh, bear fruits in the end. Thank you. Uh, the second session will start in 30 minutes. We will take a few moments of your time, five minutes before we move to the other session. Um, yeah, after all those questions, I'm especially glad that we still have two more days uh, together to talk this out, because I'm not going to manage in my minus one minute. Um, no, but really, uh, really excellent questions. I'll say just a few words on the three that were, were directed to me. Um, on the articulation of a, a kind of a youth agenda or youth principles for uh, for just transition, I think that's an amazing initiative and something that absolutely needs to to move forward. In global climate and environmental justice spaces, of course, we've seen this huge mobilization of, of youth movements who speak with um, with great legitimacy, I think, as people who will be seeing more and more of the costs of the climate crisis. Uh, in terms of sort of ongoing processes, so we at, at TNI, at the Transnational Institute, we are not our, ourselves a, a social movement. We are a think tank and we kind of work with um, and accompany different social movements in their own processes, ongoing processes. Uh, so we're not leading a process of discussion on the just transition, but I know that there have been kind of processes of uh, articulating stronger shared international perspectives. There was a large process in the run-up to the COP26 
in Glasgow that was done by the COP26 Civil Society Coalition and that had a very strong international component to kind of drive these discussions forward. There's also um, more than more than one kind of international discussion space, but the one that I'm most aware of is the Demand Climate Justice Coalition, uh, which is working in, in various ways to keep articulating um, environmental and climate justice perspectives. So those would be some kind of potential spaces to to connect and to ensure a good articulation between this this newer work and the work that's gone on so far. But I would be really happy to chat more about that over the over the coffee. Um, in terms of culture and education, our question from Zoom, I absolutely think that uh, that education and uh, culture have a very critical role to play. Um, as Farah pointed out, a lot of the, the shift that we need as part of a just transition is also a cultural shift and a shift in values, a, a revaluing and recentering of care and um, both for, for ecosystems and for each other. So I think there's huge space for education to drive that forward. And I think that um, it's important that we think also in terms of um, education as, as popular education, education as political formation, and education as providing spaces for movements to grow and to learn from each other. So it's both education of, of youth, but also a kind of building of collective social knowledge and the providing of space for that. And I would say spaces like this are also uh, part of that. Uh, and then lastly, the question from our um, comrade in the Tunisian Union. Um, thanks very much, and I hope we can chat more um, throughout the conference. Um, yeah, it's, it's a very difficult question, right? The question of how to work um, with people whose jobs are dependent on the current fossil fuel industry. Um, and to start a conversation about, about transformation. Um, so the the kind of effective strategies that we've heard about from from unions that we know are working with with people um sorry are working on this this kind of issue is um i think on the one hand an internal strategy of just starting internal discussions about it so the trade union Confeder confederation of the americas for example has for a long time had an internal working group on just transition that tries to articulate but without trying to without immediately taking something into the public as a campaign but to start conversations internally within their unions and with their representatives to see like what could this mean for us or what would it definitely not mean who could be potential allies who would definitely not be um and start yeah feeling out those positions internally and then the other kind of effective strategy that we've observed is um, or heard about from our, our partners is working on fairly um, focused and discrete campaigns with uh, with other movements and especially with environmental justice movements so at moments where um, where there's a, a discussion around a new policy that will have impacts on both the environment and workers for example we heard from from the Dutch trade unions um, who worked with Dutch environmental justice organizations to really develop a shared platform with the agreement that okay in in this kind of in certain conditions where there's not enough support provided for workers in a new government policy for example the environmental organizations will also walk away from the table um, and vice versa right so really formulating shared shared demands for what change has to look like um, but starting from a from a concrete issue the other one that our partners um, spoke about was the partners in Nigeria who started working in the midst of a fuel price crisis, started working also with environmental justice organizations to to kind of talk about what kind of policies could simultaneously address um, the urgent challenges of people who needed fuel, um, but also the longer term perspective of how do we shift to an economy that's more sustainable. Um, so, but that, of course, will depend very, very much on your particular political context um, and like what could be the moments. I guess the other one that has often helped to bring together um, environmental and labor movements has been debates and discussions around trade unions. So, for example, the, the ongoing negotiations of the ALECA or DCFTA uh, trade agreement between EU um, and Tunisia 
has the possibility to bring a number of negative effects for both workers and environment. Um, so it's a space where there could be maybe space for some common thinking on, on strategies, but you know far, far better than I do the, the context and the possible areas of alliances. But um, that kind of focus on concrete campaigns is something that we've heard can be a good way to start, start the discussions and start building trust between different movements. Um, I would love to speak on all the other topics, but I will not. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the question. I think Firas. Uh, I think that the question is extremely important about advocacy, about the role of the government, the Iraqi government, and in general, the role of governments, uh, the mechanisms that can be adopted uh, by the civil society uh, and uh, the advocacy mechanisms that can be used in order to be more influential. In Iraq, Advocacy-based evidence was quite a successful mechanism. So LDA was to gather data, collect, collect information from local activists and local uh, partners from grassroots organizations. Uh, this succeeded. So the aim was uh, to shed light on the truth, uh, what's truly happening on the ground. And uh, this evidence uh, gathered can help us develop a bottom-up approach for advocacy. So this uh, communication, this cooperation and coordination with the grassroots organizations helped us to develop a bottom-up approach uh, with, uh, with the uh, local authorities uh, starting from the bottom and going uh, to uh, the upper parts of the pyramid. Uh, so it was extremely important to work on advocacy campaigns uh, uh, with, for example, the governance, uh, the community leaders, uh, those uh, who are influential uh, on the ground. So if this approach uh, succeeds, we can move uh, to uh, upper levels. So if we do not find a final solution uh, at the local level, at least we can find a partial solution. So if the local leader, for example, the local community leaders do not have a complete uh, uh, power to change a certain, uh, a certain issue, we might uh, suggest, for example, that this local leader becomes part of the advocacy uh, campaign organized at the national level. So we move according to a bottom-up approach. We start gathering evidence, gathering data on the grassroots level so that we can develop a bottom-up approach, uh, move from the local community leaders to the national leaders. Uh, regarding the role of the Iraqi government, this is a challenge for us. So the Iraqi uh, government is made of uh, uh, different uh, influential uh, parties, as you know. This is the eighth month after the election, and we are still unable to form a government because of uh, the different parties uh, that are uh, participating, if you could say so, in uh, the governance of the country. So it is very important to be able to work with the local community leaders uh, to have a certain visibility as well in the media. And after that moves to communicating with national leaders. So local community leaders can be part of the solution. It's not the solution. So we're uh, seizing the opportunity working on that part in particular. Uh, so we know that we might not uh, succeed uh, completely, but at least uh, we can um, build on these uh, positive uh, initiatives uh, with the local community leaders and before moving to the national level. Thank you, uh, Salmad. Uh, thank you for your contribution. This was an extremely important session. We have raised many questions, answered some of these questions, and we started uh, noticing some of the contradictions uh, that will be uh, discussed during these three days. We have a 15 to 20 minute break before uh, coming back at noon.